Good morning. It's Wednesday, December 20th. Israel has been at war for 75 days. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President at Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and welcome back to the FDD Morning Brief. I'm not going to tell you that this is the 20 minutes you need to get up to speed on the news. I'm not going to tell you that there is too much out there for any one person to read. I'm not going to tell you that we do all of this so you don't have to. I'm just here to tell you that we're glad you've tuned into the FDD Morning Brief, so let's do this. This morning, I'll be joined by Elon Levy, the Israeli foreign minister's uh, ministry spokesman who became an online sensation when his eyes almost popped out of his head. We'll try to get a reenactment this morning. But before we attempt those ocular gymnastics, let's take a quick look at what's happening this morning in the news. The IDF says it has uncovered more than 1,500 tunnels and shafts throughout the Gaza Strip. The amount of underground infrastructure is simply staggering. The tough fighting may only take another month or two, but the time and effort needed to dismantle all of this subterranean stuff, I'm hearing that might take a year. The IDF has investigated a serious allegation made by the Latin church in Shaja'iya. Church officials said the IDF shot two people in the church on December 17th and that it did so for no reason. The Israelis say soldiers responded to an RPG attack and they shot two of the spotters that helped guide that attack on IDF troops. It's worth noting here that the Pope condemned Israel for this incident. I'm curious to see if the pontiff doubles down or if he walks that one back. The IDF says it came close to Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar not once but two times in recent days. Reports suggest that Sinwar has surrounded himself with Israeli hostages they serve as human shields for the Hamas leader who launched the 10-7 attack. And yes, in case you're wondering, that is a violation of international law. Sinwar is reportedly unhappy today as some of his Hamas colleagues are in discussions with the Palestinian Authority about the day after in Gaza. Sinwar apparently thinks he can still win this thing. Leaders from Palestinian Islamic Jihad are also thinking about the end game, uh, according to reports I read this morning. This means that both of Iran's primary Palestinian proxies are running out of gas in Gaza. I'd say this is good news, but I'm a Middle East pessimist, so I'll just put it this way. Let's keep an eye on it. Moving on now to the top three big stories to watch today. Headline one, Hamas political leader Ismail Haniya is set to visit Egypt today to discuss the possibility of another hostage for prisoner swap, as well as the possibility of a ceasefire with Israel. Here's what we know. I'd love to see the Egyptians arrest Haniya. They won't. But that said, the Egyptians continue to play a somewhat positive role in this saga. I would trust the Egyptians a heck of a lot more than I would trust the Qataris. And I think the Israelis feel that way too. After all, the government in Cairo holds a rather dim view of Hamas, given that it is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. And if there's one organization that the Sisi regime hates, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. But here's the thing. People I talk to in Israel believe that since the last round of fighting in 2021, the vast majority of weapons and rockets that Hamas has acquired have transited tunnels from Egypt. I'd venture to say that these tunnels are the main arteries for Hamas fighters that come and go in order to train in places like Iran and Turkey, and they are certainly the escape routes for people like Yahya Sinwar. Cairo says that there are no tunnels. I'm not saying that the Egyptians are lying here, but if there aren't any active tunnels, how are the weapons getting in and how are the fighters getting out? We'll find out soon enough because the Israelis will soon need to start tackling the tunnels at Rafah. And in the immortal words of Ricky Ricardo, if it turns out that there are still operational tunnels, Egypt will have some splaining to do. Headline two, U.S. Central Command is standing up an international maritime coalition to deter Houthi attacks on the Red Sea. Operation Prosperity Guardian, yeah, that's kind of a bad name, but Operation Prosperity Garden, Guardian will include the navies of Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, the Seychelles, and the UK. Here's who the coalition doesn't include, the Saudis and the Emiratis. These are the two countries that were hit almost exclusive, exclusively by the Houthis before October 7th. Now they don't want to invite more fire from the Houthis by joining the war nor do they want to be seen as siding with Israel. Not exactly profiles in courage. So now what? It's worth asking here, what do the United States and its partners expect to accomplish? Operation Prosperity Guardian strikes 
uh, or it might as well be named Operation Defensive Crouch. If the coalition doesn't destroy the Iran-supplied missiles and drones, the Houthis will keep firing them. Without a cost imposed, Iran will continue to create chaos by proxy on one of the world's most strategic waterways. I'm not saying war is the answer, but I'm sure that this isn't the answer either. Meanwhile, Malaysia, another Hamas sponsor, has announced a ban on Israeli vessels looking to dock in the country. The government has essentially joined forces with the Houthis. This is not entirely surprising. Hamas operatives have found safe haven there for years. In fact, the Mossad has actually killed Hamas operatives there. My guess is that we'll see some of that in the weeks or months to come. And finally, headline three, Israel is reportedly mulling a pause in the Gaza war for at least one week in exchange for the release of 40 hostages. Here's what we know. Talks have been going on now for days. Israel's Mossad director, David Barnea, met with the Qatari prime minister, Mohammed Abdurrahman al Thani, and the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, several times in Europe. According to the deal on the table, the hostages would include the remaining women, the older men, and other hostages in need of medical care. In return, Israel would stop the war for a week or perhaps more and also release Palestinian prisoners. Reports this morning suggest that Hamas wants this deal in writing. Right. So now what? The Israelis seem determined to finish off Hamas, and for good reason. And frustration was growing with the Qataris, for good reason. But I understand the total commitment to saving Israeli hostages, and this might be the last chance to recover them. Also, don't forget, the U.S. is pressuring Israel for another pause amidst concerns over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. But I fear that every time the fighting stops, Hamas will be able to make additional preparations to mount more deadly attacks when the fighting resumes. But that's just me. Okay, those are your headlines. Uh, I am now pleased to welcome Elon Levy. He is an official spokesman for the Israeli Foreign Ministry. He's now well known for not having a poker face when Western media reveal their biases against Israel. We'll talk about that momentarily. I also just learned that Mr. Levy translated one of my favorite books written by Israeli author Mika Goodman. Catch 67 is the name of that book, and it's a worthwhile read for those unfamiliar. Welcome, Elon. Thank you, Jonathan. Just a small correction. I'm a spokesman for the Israeli government, not the foreign ministry, but thanks for the promotion. Ah, sorry. Corrected. Got it. Um, I didn't know if that was a promotion, maybe a demotion, but uh, at any rate, um, let's let's get into it. I want to talk for just a second about your eye-opening meme. Uh, for those that didn't catch it, maybe you can give a, uh, a kind of a quick overview and then Maybe just tell us what it's like to suddenly become an internet meme. I get asked a lot of very strange questions. A lot of journalists ask very sensible questions. They want to find the facts, but others ask questions that show that they're telling a very different story in their heads from reality. And this was a question with Kay Burley on Sky News just around the time of the first hostage release pause. And she asked me whether the fact that Israel was willing to release three prisoners for every one hostage showed that we undervalued Palestinian lives uh, and that we thought Palestinian lives were worth less. And it doesn't really matter what I answered because my initial response was to raise my eyebrows so high they nearly shot out of the frame altogether. Okay, and that let, me, let, me just, let me just see you do it again. Can you just give me one of those? Yeah, okay, it's good. Okay. That moment went viral in Israel because it touched a nerve. Many Israelis feel that sometimes it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what we say, there are some people who are always going to be against us and will always twist uh, our own deeds against us, even at our most vulnerable moments, even at the moments of our purest and most refined morality that we're willing to release violent criminals to get our children back. That gets spat back against us. So that struck a nerve in Israel. And since then, I've done almost as many Israeli television interviews as, as international media. Yeah, I've, I've caught you on some of those. Well, you've got a tough job, um, uh, you know, getting out there every say. day. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, pardon me for saying so, but I mean, what, what would you say is kind of the biggest challenge, the biggest lie that you've had to combat, the biggest uh, sort of piece of disinformation, misinformation that you've had to get out there in battle? Let me tell you about the biggest misconception. There have been so many rounds of conflict with Hamas that I don't think people around the world understand what a tectonic shift October 7th was. 
what a massive earthquake it was, and how there was an Israel before October 7th and Israel after October 7th, and they're very different places. It dominates every conversation. It overshadows everything, not only for us in Israel, for Jews around the diaspora. It was a moment, it was a slap in the face and a wake-up call that brought together Israelis from left and right in a country that had experienced some poisonous polarization over the previous year, united with a very deep sense of justice, that this has to end with the end of Hamas. We have no choice and we have to go all the way to the end. And sometimes the impression I get from questions I'm asked is, okay, Israelis, you've had your fun. When is this going to end? When can you wrap up? When can you declare victory? And we have to say, no, we're really going all the way to the end. We are going to destroy the Hamas terror regime. We are going to bring back all of the hostages. This is a very personal issue for us. We're going to do everything we can to live up to that pledge that there will be no one left behind. The atrocities have shaken us in a way that you can't begin to imagine. Let me give you an example. You know, I thought I'd heard about the most horrific October 7th atrocities. Really, I thought I'd heard it all. And just now I had lunch with a group of influencers who came on an AJC delegation. And the chap in front of me tells me about a friend of his. Uh, he gets a message from him on the morning of October 7th. He <sighs> was at the Nova Festival and the Hamas terrorists had castrated him shoved it in his mouth, and then sent it on his friend's WhatsApp group and to his mother. And that was how she found out. That was a story I found out half an hour ago. The atrocities of October 7th continue to come to light and remind us why we are fighting. So when people say ceasefire, we say the fire will cease when Hamas runs out of fire because we will never let it burn our people alive again. Hmm. That's quite a story. Yeah. Um, so look, um, Israel takes a lot of heat for failing at, at what is described in, in Hebrew as Hasbara. Hasbara, of course, means explaining. And as FED's founder and president, Cliff May, has said, if you're explaining, you're losing. Is Israel losing? Is Israel still explaining? Or have the Israelis done a better, t a better job this time around? Look, let's have a look first at the battlefield. We're outnumbered and outgunned when it comes to public diplomacy. We are David against Goliath. There are 16 million Jews in the world. Not all of them are with us. There are many more Arabs, many more Muslims, many more people who are receptive to the Palestinian message, especially when the young people are getting their information from TikTok. TikTok favors virality. And when you already have numbers on your side, the algorithm amplifies that and it's pumping venom into people's minds. And we have a serious problem there, especially when our enemies use violent intimidation tactics and what I call Gaza lighting to try to make us doubt our own humanity, doubt our own morality, doubt our own sanity, and scare people away from standing up for what we think is a pretty basic demand that people have a right to sleep in their beds without being raped, abducted, and beheaded. Now, what we're doing in this war is we're shifting gears. We're going from defense to offense, because after 10-7, I don't think we owe anyone any answers. I think Hamas owes people answers. I think the Red Cross that admitted that it's not putting pressure on Hamas to secure access to the hostages owes us answers. I think the World Health Organization, which is still covering up the fact that Hamas is waging war out of hospitals, owes us answers. I think that UNRWA, that admitted that Hamas stole its fuel, then deleted that tweet and denied it, owes us answers. We do not owe the world explanations for why we are fighting to bring the October 7th monsters to justice, to bring our people home to safety, and to bring their tormentors to justice. That is the state of Israel's state admission statement, and that is what guides us. We think we are owed answers by the international community, the agencies that are covering up for the fact they are covering up for Hamas, that have been complicit with its war. We think they owe us answers because they're letting not only us down, not only the Palestinians down, they're letting down the whole world. They're letting down anyone who looks up at the United Nations and thinks it has moral authority, that it stands for those founding values and don't understand how profoundly it has been corrupted and hijacked. They owe us answers and it's our job to put them on the back foot. Okay, so I think you've set, you've set the tone here. I think it's really important actually for our listeners and viewers to, to get a sense of that because you know, watching Israeli media day in and day out, I can see that sense of outrage, that sense of indignation, that sense of not having to answer to anyone. And yet, what we see right now are tensions that are brewing within a number of Israel's diplomatic relationships. So the, the one that I think is the most obvious to ask about here is the U.S.-Israel relationship. There are signs that the Biden administration is getting a bit weary, a little wobbly in the knees. 
do you get a sense that things are going to build to a head where there will be a showdown between the Israeli government and the American government over the continuation of this war? Or do you think that things are going pretty well and that they're managed? I think the media reports of disagreements between us and our allies are wildly overstated to try to create a sensationalist narrative. The fact remains our allies understand that this war must end with the end of Hamas. The British Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden said just last week, and I quote, we must eradicate Hamas. Did you hear that in the headlines? No. You heard that Britain is calling for a sustainable ceasefire. But if you read that column by Lord Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, and you go about 12 paragraphs down, you'll find that Britain says that Hamas must lay down its arms. There can be no future for it uh, the day after this war, and that a sustainable ceasefire is possible only after Hamas lays down its arms. So what our allies are saying, however they want to couch it domestically for political consumption, I can't possibly comment on what their concerns are. They know this war must end with the end of Hamas. The same with a joint statement from the Australians, the Canadians, and the New Zealanders. Their prime ministers calling for a sustainable ceasefire, but saying that Hamas must lay down its arms. So what's going to happen if Hamas decides to politely ignore their communique? We're going to have to force them to do so. The West understands what the consequences of inaction will be. They understand that what will drive extremism in our region is not if we bring the Hamas rapist regime to justice, but if we leave it standing after this war, free and emboldened to attack again, because it will think that the international community will hold, will tie Israel's hands and prevent it from defending itself again. And on every opportunity that American leaders are asked about this on camera, if it was Secretary Blinken on December 7th next to Lord Cameron, or Secretary Austin standing next to our defense minister the other day, they say the timetable is for Israel to determine. And it has every right to fight and destroy the terror machine responsible for the bloodiest massacre of Jews since October 7th. President Biden said right at the beginning, if this happened to the United States, its response would be swift, decisive, and overwhelming. And that is exactly what we are doing. And it's our job here in the, the Hasbara world to remind our allies of what they felt and what they knew to be right on October 7th and keep them firm and give them encouragement as we continue towards that goal of total victory over the Hamas terror regime. Okay, last question for you here. I know you've got to go and we've got to wrap up our 20 minutes here, but just for a second, just talk about the day after plan, because that's apparently the thing that is creating the most friction, at least if we're to believe American media, international media, that the lack of a plan for a sustainable Gaza after all of this, how are things going with that vision? Does Israel have a plan? Is it something that it can dictate to the rest of the world? Or are we waiting to hear from the Arab states or from the US or from Europe? We're guided by the strategic mission for the day after for Israel. What we need to do to make sure that the communities around the Gaza Strip are the safest places in the country. We've allocated a framework budget and we're going to build back better. And those communities are going to rise up from the ashes. And as I say, this war will end when it is safe enough for children to sleep in Kfar Aza that Antonio Guterres would volunteer to babysit them. Now, as for the Gaza Strip, we're guided by that mission. And we have said three principles that need to happen to avoid a relapse into violence. Gaza must be demilitarized. It must never host an army of terror capable of using it as a giant launch pad against Israel. There must be sustainable reconstruction. The concrete this time must go into people's homes and not into the tunnels we have been exposing under the Shifa hospital, the two and a half mile long tunnel as wide as a subway, uh, as wide as a, a subway tunnel. And the third is Gaza must be de-radicalized. We cannot have a new generation being brought up on a regime of jihad and martyrdom being told by the United Nations that they are only temporarily in Gaza because they are refugees and one day somewhere over the rainbow they have a right to live in Israel and they have a right to pursue that by violence. The perpetuation of the Palestinian refugee problem has only ever brought us terrorism and that terrorism has only ever brought the Palestinians misery. And we need the world to tell the Palestinians some tough truths, that 1948 is over, that Israel is here to exist, that it has a right to robustly defend its borders, and their best hope of a peaceful and prosperous future is to make their peace with the existence of the state of Israel and work out how to live next to it instead of constantly trying to replace it. Okay, well, you've got your work cut out for you. 
I want to thank you, Elon Levy, for joining us today on the FBI Thank you, Jonathan. Brief. Okay, here are the other stories FTD is following today. Over at FTD's Long War Journal, my colleague Joe Trusman has a new piece out on the statements by Palestinian terror groups claiming responsibility for carrying out suicide bombings against Israeli troops. Well, it's certainly not a new technique. It is a worrying trend and something Joe will continue to track closely. My colleagues Saeed Ghassabinejad and Behnam Ben Talablu are out with a piece in The Messenger today outlining a dozen policies the Biden administration could pursue toward Iran to begin deterring the regime and building a more coherent regional policy. Lord knows we need one. Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria have now attacked American forces more than 100 times since October 17th. My colleagues Brad Bowman and Mike Down are now looking at the data behind each one of these attacks. We'll be putting a map out soon, and here's hoping the U.S. military comes up with a way to either prevent these attacks or to even respond. Read all of our terrific work at FDD.org. Follow our spot analysis on X at FDD. And if you like our stuff, go ahead and make a tax-deductible contribution at FDD.org slash invest. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for more FDD Morning Briefs, thank you for joining. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, signing off for FDD.